Menachem, uh, the order of the day seems to be if you're going to create consonance between uh, science and theology, science and religion, uh, religion has got to be the one that changes because science delivers truth. The truth often contradicts what has been historical religious positions. So in order to have consonance, religion's got to keep changing and changing and changing. And to some scientists, uh, the ultimate change will be to fade out of existence. Uh, how, how do you see the nature of, uh, of, uh, religion having to change in the in the light of scientific advances I'm going to speak as a historian and philosopher of science and not not in the light of scientific advances so much as advances in the in our understanding of science not of scientific understanding mm -hmm. okay uh, and we've come a long way in that regard I'd like to say a word about it. Um, but, but just to set aside, I mean, that, that there are aspects, certainly of my religion, which is, a, which, which is a, a religion based on ritual law, where some of the facts that science uh, um, uh, rightly boasts to know about human nature and, 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 and so on and so forth, impact on halachic, on ritual, ritual law, um, Jewish, law, uh, yeah. Jewish, Jewish ritual law um, issues. Okay, and I can give what, a. What's an example? Yeah. Um, what's an example? There, there are medical procedures. Uh, I, I don't want to go into any details, but there are medical uh, procedures to do, say, with the male genitals, <laughs> that would, that are taken by halacha to. Um, uh, 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 to disallow uh, a man like that to marry because he can't have children according mm. to halakha. Mm. But medicine shows us that this improves his fertility. <laughs> so halakha needs to adjust from mm. that point of view. And there was a raging uh, um, controversy at the beginning of the 18th century when these procedures were first introduced and, and so on and so forth. But I, I think at least from a philosophical point of view, um, these these empirical impingings on 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 the religious world view are less important than the very idea of doctrinal change itself. Yeah. Okay. And here here I would like here I would like to introduce a distinction, which is a philosophical distinction, which applies equally to science and to religion. And that is the distinction between what uh, Kuhn... Uh, uh, um, Thomas, not me. Th yes, <laughs> Thomas Kuhn, right, right, not, not right. you. Uh, that Thomas Kuhn called normal science. In other words, um, uh, the day-by-day the, the -day work of scientists improving their theories, challenging mm -hmm. their theories, uh, uh, um, improving their experimental methods and, and so on and so forth, go about their business, okay? Um, and, and we could talk of, of, and he called this normal science, normal science. And we could talk about normal religion, the way in which, uh, you know, the day-by-day -day improvement of religious understanding, uh, of, of, of religious interpretation, uh, and so on and so forth. Some would say that's a null set that religion doesn't improve or change the way science does. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> but, 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 but of course it does. I mean, but, okay. but, but I, the distinction I want to make is that, is that normal science or day by day uh, religious deliberation are by necessity conducted by a framework of norms of appropriateness. Okay? I grant you that. Um, both in science and in religion. To challenge doctrines, I take to be, is to challenge the framework, not the workings within the framework. Okay? Now here, science has an advantage over religion, not because it gets the truth uh, in an objective sense of the way, uh, as, as, as you open, but because it, it has experienced over the, 
over the last three or four centuries, in each and every one of the disciplines, framework mm. transitions, mm -hmm. where, the, where, the, where the very norms mm. of science have changed. Mm. And the question mm. is, how do they change? Okay. Now, religious people from within their religious frameworks tend to believe that their doctrines are God-given truths. Um, very much in the way that Immanuel Kant in the first critique, the critique of pure reason, envisaged the scientific framework, okay, the categories uh, by, which, by which we judge and assess uh, in science, um, the, mathematical, the mathematical sets of truths, what he called the forms of intuition of space and, space and time by which uh, um, every object of our, of our uh, scientific work is situated. And he believed that what he called the synthetic a priori, sorry for the, mm -hmm. sorry for the technical term, mm -hmm. but this body of constitutive mm -hmm. standards of truth within which science progresses mm -hmm. and does its business is hardwired into the human psyche, absolute and set for all time. This is, this is the Kantian synthetic <laughs> a priori. Mm -hmm. Synthetic in the sense that it's about the empirical world, a priori, that it's pre-given, but pre-given in, 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 in an absolute, uh, timeless way. Many religious people view their doctrines mm -hmm. in those Absolutely terms right. as God-given, absolute, yeah. certain truths. Now, this is, this is where religion might learn something from science. If we've learned anything after the great revolution in physics, for example, at the beginning of the 20th century, is that science, that scientific practice and knowledge is indeed governed by a synthetic, a priori body of standards, of facticity, standards of explanation, standards of Scientific method. Of scientific, scientific method. But, and this is, this is why Neo-Kantianism is called Neo-Kantianism, mm. but it's no longer hardwired and absolute. Mm. And the synthetic a priori changes. Mm. Now this is what Thomas Kuhn loosely called paradigm shifts, which I like <coughs> to refer to as framework Transition. Distinguish between the two and why you like framework better than paradigm. Because, because framework, I think, is a more philosophically exact term. Paradigm is, paradigm sort of uh, 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 connotes an example, mm. okay, a paradigmatic mm. example. I'm, I'm referring to a system, to a framework of, of, of uh, normative touchdowns. Um, let, let me say a word further. Any judgment religious, scientific, political, ethical. Any judgment, any, or stronger, to act rationally, in general, is to take action for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. To take action sure. for a reason, <clears throat> not instinctively, not, you know, for a reason. The only reason to take action is because the situation one finds oneself in is sufficiently wanting or lacking mm -hmm. to justify in your mind your intervention. You also, it, it's also a judgment that you are the person to do, to do so. But in order to make that kind of move, you need standards of propriety to be in place prior to acting. Okay, so people who are committed to different norms will find different situations problematic. Right, sure. Okay? So rationality itself is framework dependent. Okay? So th this is, it, it's not paradigm dependent, it's framework dependent. In, 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 so so this, is, this is the dependency I'm talking about. Now, so religion, religion is acted in and religion, religion is lived rationally in the sense, in, in precisely that sense, as a system by which you judge to act or, 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 or not to act, 
okay, according to a set of religious standards, and in science the same. You, you act and proceed in accord with scientific. Yeah, but the fundamental difference is in religion, at least in most cases, is believed to be by the adherents something that has been revealed from the ultimate source, God or something like God. Whereas in science, it is, is generally recognized that this is the way of thinking uh, uh, at the time. That's a fundamental difference because uh, to many religious people, uh, if their doc doctrines are challenged, it, 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 is, uh, it, it is an error of the challenger. It is not an error of the, of the divine revelation. Yeah. It's a fundamental different way of thinking. That's true. But, but religious people are also wary about whether they, good, they, they got the good word right. Okay? Well, and, and maybe some, but not, not okay. at all. Okay, but, but I, I mean, some scientists fool themselves into believing that, 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 that there are no frameworks and that science, science proceeds by an objective timeless set yes. of standards. Yeah. So, but I, I'm talking, as I said, as a, <laughs> as a historian and philosopher of science, um, whose, whose philosophy is a neo-Kantian. Now, I think that the, the way in which philosophers of science have posed themselves the question as, ha as to how one can speak of a rational transition, a rational framework transition in science, is something that most religious people don't ask themselves. I say most, right, right, right. right. But, but science has asked itself, and that question has virtually stumped the philosophical community. Because in order to be, in order to be able to say that I've changed my standards of judgment yes. rationally, right. by what standards? That means, uh, that means addressing them by means by, by, you know, by, by, by critical appraisal. But how can I change the norms by which I critically appraise? How can I find wanting the norms that I critically appraise? Now, in, in my work for the last several years, I've, I've developed the idea in the philosophy of science that the way in which science indeed uh, succeeds in... in, in, in in, in rationally changing its framework from time to time is not by talking to itself. A person talking to himself will be talking by means of those norms and standards he's committed to. But exposure to the echo chamber of criticism from without, mm -hmm. from the point of view of people who are not committed to the norms I'm committed to, can very, very often have an ambivalating, I use that as <laughs> an ambivalating effect on us to the extent that will allow us to create sufficient um, uh, self-distancing and self-alienation from our standards to take critical stock. So your prescription to religion is to do the same? Exactly. Good luck. Well, uh, first of all, our generation, Robert, has um, experienced a proliferation of interfaith dialogue. Now, very much interfaith dialogue is about finding our commonalities and we're all the children of Abraham and so on and so forth, which is nice and cozy, but not challenging in the least. But some of these groups, and I'm involved with them, get together with the explicit idea of enjoying the challenge of otherness, of enjoying a discussion, of enjoying being exposed to the scriptures of a religion very, very different from your own, dealing with the same mundane problems of marriage and children and wisdom and knowing God and doing the right thing and morality and ethics, but very, very often from a radically different point of view. And this has a, a challenging, in the best sense of the term, um, impact, transformative impact even. Now I think, and this is, this, is, this, this is perhaps for a longer conversation, but I'm willing to argue that Talmudic Judaism, the formative text of rabbinic Judaism of late antiquity, um, were very much aware of that. 
and their argumentative dialogical method um, of, 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 uh, of religiously deliberating extends way out outside the, 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 the boundaries of the, you know, the coziness of the in-house rabbinic discussion. Um, and I think it does so deliberately. Deliberately, because that's the only way in which you can create a self-distance from uh, 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 you know, your framework truths, as Wittgenstein call, called them, and be able to get a critical and rational grip on them. Now, uh, uh, the last sentence I say is that, I'll, I'll say is the following, that the relig all, the re all three monotheistic religions have changed uh, quite profoundly over the centuries. And they have done so not, not in the middle. They've done so by interacting wittingly or unwittingly with the other, with the other two. And um, the three religions have had each other on their mind all the time <laughs> and, you know, defining themselves in opposition to each other as continuations of each other, sharing unwittingly most of the time notions of sacredhood, uh, holy architecture, uh, um, family, family structure, law, liturgy, uh, religious expression, and so on and so forth. And if, if um, the lesson, I think, from science uh, to religion is to make this explicit. <laughs>